we did not know how the fish will behave. Usually the fish swim away when they see the strong lights of Iago, but this fish didn't care about the lights. It's so large and it's moving in such a different way than other fish do, which makes it really a spectacular experience to, to discover a fish like this. Shower immediately radioed Fricker with the exciting news. Jürgen called me with a ship radio, and I said to him, give everybody a kiss, I give you a bottle of champagne, and so on and so on. I was very, very enthusiastic about it. And on the end of the con conversation, the operator said, what the hell is this, what you were talking about? And I said, the silicon. And uh, he, he asked me, what is a silicon? I said, it's an old, ugly, oily fish. As expected, coelacanths were found to live in a fairly uninhabited ecosystem and seem to have no real predators. They aggregate during the day in volcanic caves and at night have been known to migrate to depths of over 2,000 feet. But unexpectedly, films of the coelacanth showed how the multiple fins function and laid to rest the idea of a crawling fish first put forward by J.L.B. Smith. Smith said, uh, yeah, they are creeping on the bottom, uh, like seals, and of course they don't. They are not walking. They are continuous hovering above the ground. The coelacanth moves unlike any other fish of this size. Its oil-filled body allows it to maintain neutral buoyancy and float in any position. Six fins are almost constantly in motion, like oars in the water. Upper and lower fins toward the rear of the creature, plus two pairs of limb-like fins, front and center. And there was something surprising about the way these limb-like fins moved. Although the coelacanth was not using them to crawl on the bottom, to the expert eye, their motion hinted at walking. Walking like we do. According to Susan Jewett, the fish collection manager at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, and an international expert in coelacanth biology. It's got paired pectoral fins and paired pelvic fins. These are particularly interesting because this fish has what's called a tetrapod form of swimming. We, being tetrapods, have all learned that uh, when we walk, we move the right arm forward in synchrony with the left leg. Well, the fish sort of swims like that with that right pectoral and the left pelvic going in synchrony with one another. Um, very interesting characteristics, which again is one of very many characteristics that place it in that evolutionary line towards higher vertebrates. If the coelacanth swims like a land animal walks, does that too suggest it's our closest living relative among the fishes? To this day, the evidence is inconclusive. Until recently, most researchers put coelacanths nearest to tetrapods on an evolutionary tree. But now, a group known as lungfish is thought to be an even closer ancestor, based on new DNA evidence. We may never know for certain which group of fishes contains our closest living relative. Still, the coelacanth continues to surprise science at every turn. 6,000 miles from the Comoros, on the other side of the Indian Ocean in Indonesia, the sudden discovery of a coelacanth would disrupt the lives of two young scientists. An uncanny echo of the events in South Africa some 60 years before. Mark Erdman, a marine biologist studying coral shrimp, and Arnaz Mehta, a naturalist, had just started a life together as husband and wife here in Indonesia, when the coelacanth made its unexpected appearance. 
It all began in the local fish market when Mark and Arnaz, stepping out of a taxi, spotted a strange-looking fish on a fish cart. I went over to the cart, and I stared at this fish, uh, looking, thinking it was a grouper at first, but then the head was all wrong, and the, everything was wrong about it. And then I called Mark over, and, the, and our other two friends, they came and looked at it, and Mark, sort of in disbelief, said it was a salicant. It just seemed really kind of incredulous that we could step out of a taxi in a city of over half a million people and see something that was really a big deal go wheeling by on a fish cart. They took a photograph, but did not purchase the fish, thinking Indonesian coelacanths were already well known to science. But they soon learned the uniqueness of their sighting. No scientist had ever found a coelacanth, except near South Africa and the Comoros Islands. Mark and Arnaz quickly embarked on a quest to find a second specimen. Like J.L.B. Smith before them, they enlisted the aid of local fishermen. A new hunt was on for the elusive coelacanth. As in the Comoros, this fish was known locally. Fishermen called it Raja Laut, King of the Sea. Mark wanted to make sure that if one was captured again by these fishermen, that he would be able to get it. So he offered a very modest award, uh, reward rather. I think it was perhaps double the market price, and it, it's not a good eating fish, so the market price couldn't have been very high. But it was enough to entice the fishermen to bring it to him when they caught it, and that's exactly what happened. Then, 10 months after the initial sighting, Mark and Arnaz had a visit. And my boatman showed up, and he burst out, Ada Rajal out. Come quick, there's a coelacanth on the beach. We rushed down the stairs, Arnaz grabbed the video camera, and uh, we went down to see if this was indeed the fish. Like all of its predecessors, the creature soon found life at the surface impossible. But before the great fish died, the couple took it out to deeper water to get photographs in a more natural setting. Arnaz even had a few moments to swim alongside. The fish had been caught several hours earlier, and it was really down to its final hour. During that time, you know, her fins were still moving, still flouncing, and then her dorsal fin would raise, and then once in a while she would take a big gulp of water. And she was extremely calm um, in her inevitable demise. I couldn't get over how beautiful her scales were. There are, there are these, you know, these scales that were speckled with these gold flecks. And um, it was like, it was like a slow dance. It's certainly sad to watch such a majestic beast die so slowly. When DNA samples of the Indonesian coelacanth were sequenced, they suggested that this was a new species and dissuaded scientists from the idea that the Indonesian fish was a stray. In fact, from the DNA analysis, it seems that the two populations were separated many millions of years ago. Once again, the mysterious fossil fish surprised scientists around the world. The Indonesian discovery upset the whole apple cart. Um, science was all nice and happy. They'd got these little um, enclaves in the Comores all sorted out and that anything that was outside that was astray. Now all of a sudden, um, 10,000 kilometers away, right across the other side of the Indian Ocean, we have another colony of coelacanths. And it's not just one or two, it's not strays, it's a colony. They are known to the Indonesian fishermen, which suggests to me that, that um, they're actually more, far more widespread than, than we think. The fact that, uh, that we could find this animal in a place that's relatively well known to ichthyologists, it would not surprise me in the least if 
over the next 50 or 100 years that it is revealed that the coelacanth actually exists pretty much in one continuous population from the Western Indian Ocean all the way up to Indonesia. didn't live to hear the story of the Indonesian coelacanth. In 1968, after years of ill health and in constant pain, Smith took his own life. He was 70 years old.